Um, we finished our discussion of local properties of Vedashreni random graphs last time, uh, meaning properties that are determined by a fixed number of vertices. Uh, now we are going to uh, start our discussion of uh, global properties, which uh, for which there isn't a bound on the number of vertices determining the property. Uh, the first property we look at is the size of the largest connected component and later on in the course we'll also look at whether the graph as a whole is connected. Uh, but let's begin with the size of the largest connected component. Uh, okay, so uh, let's, so we are working with the Edrisch-Renyi random graph GNP. And it's clear what happens at two extreme values of P. So you have a collection of nodes. And then as P increases, you add more and more edges. So let me draw these nodes twice. So if P equals zero, then the probability of any edge being present is zero. So, uh, so each connected component consists of just a single vertex. So if we define uh, C, um, C max to be the size of the largest connected component, then C max is zero. Uh, and on the other extreme, if P equals one, not sorry, C max is one, not zero. Each connected component is of size one, consists of a single vertex. The size, by the size of a connected component, we mean the number of vertices in it. Again, at the other extreme, when P equals one, each edge is present with probability one. So we get the complete graph on all n nodes. And so the size of that graph is n. Every, uh, every vertex is present. Okay, and I may have missed some edges, but C max here is n. Uh, okay, and what what do we expect to happen as we gradually increase p from zero to one? If we plot c max against p, what does the graph look like? So one possibility is that somehow it increases smoothly from one to n between not and one. But it won't surprise you based on what you've seen so far if I tell you that uh, there's actually some value of P at which, um, so the size stays long, up, uh, small up to some value of P and suddenly increases uh, as P gets large. Okay, I'm not going to draw this. It depends on the scale at which we draw this. Um, but uh, we we'll look at, but roughly speaking, you see some kind of sharp, sharp jump from very small to very big values. Then gradually going to end. Okay. Uh, okay, and let's look in more detail at how this happens. So it turns out that uh, in what we looked at so far, we took a scaling regime where P scaled as N to minus some fractional power, N to, N to minus some power, possibly fractional. It went as N to the minus alpha. Okay. Uh, in this case, we are going to look at a different scaling. Uh, we are going to take a fraction of N. So 
let's uh, consider a sequence of Edris Rennie random graphs. G and P N indexed by the number of nodes N. Uh, and we are going to take P N to be lambda over N where lambda bigger than zero is a fixed constant. Okay. Lambda is not allowed to depend on n. And then uh, we are going to look at uh, the size of the largest connected component, but scaled by n. So we are going to look at one over n times C max in the nth graph. Okay, so let me make its dependence on n explicit in the notation. So how big is the largest connected component as a fraction of the number of vertices? And now if we plot lambda against c max over n, for very large n, then the graph looks like this. It stays at zero up to some critical value, lambda critical, and then it starts increasing. Okay, and here's one. Uh, and it starts increasing towards one, but it, okay. You have to go a long way out to get to one. Uh, so basically the fraction of nodes in the largest connected component is zero up to this critical value and is not zero after that. And this critical value is in fact one, lambda c is one. So at p equals one over n, you see this transition. And in fact, you can say, even uh, finer things. Uh, so C max is a random variable, but the expectation of C max, let's say, or okay, with high probability, the largest connected component is of size uh, log n. Uh, with high probability. if lambda is smaller than one. Uh, and it's uh, a fraction of n if lambda is bigger than one. C max is some constant C that depends on lambda times n. Okay, and this is not a random constant. In fact, this is a deterministic constant, uh, but uh, C max divided by N converges in probability to C, C lambda bigger than zero if lambda is bigger than one. And we can explicitly characterize this constant. Okay, so this is the behavior we see, and let me now state this a bit more formally as a theorem, and this is theorem two in your lecture notes. So let me state this theorem. Um, Okay, I have a slightly different notation here. So uh, I won't repeat the notation for Edris Rennie random graphs, but let's denote by Cn 
be the size of the largest connected component. Addition e random graph g n p n with p n equals lambda over n. Okay, so it's uh, this sequence of graphs is parameterized by lambda, which is a given positive constant. Uh, then what can we say? Uh, if lambda is smaller than one, Cn is of order log n with high probability. All meaning since the largest connected component and hence all connected components are of size at most logarithmic in n. Uh, and secondly, if lambda is bigger than one, then uh, then Cn is asymptotic to okay we can in fact say more if lambda is bigger than one there is a uh, unique large connected component which is called the giant component Uh, of size Cn, which is asymptotic to a constant rho, which depends on lambda times n. So, so this giant component contains a fraction of all the vertices and all other components are of size O log n. Okay, so uh, take some time to make sure you understand the statement of the theorem. And I should let me also say what rho lambda is explicitly. Uh, here rho lambda is the unique solution in the open interval zero one of the equation e to the, uh, let me check. Of the equation e to the minus lambda x equals one minus x. Okay, we'll show in just a moment using pictures that indeed this equation has a unique solution between naught and one, uh, and the value of x that solves this equation is rho lambda. So let me repeat the theorem again. If lambda is smaller than one, then uh, every connected component contains at most some multiple of log n vertices. Uh, and if lambda is bigger than one, uh, then uh, most, 
all except one connected component still have this property. They have at most some multiple of log n vertices, but there's one component which is uh, very big and which contains a fraction of all the vertices. Okay, and this happens, yeah, this sharp transition in behavior happens at lambda equals one. And the fraction of vertices is obtained by solving this equation. Okay, so let, I promised I'll explain why that equation has a unique solution between naught and one. So let's draw a picture. So I'm going to plot uh, two things here. One is the function e to the minus lambda x. So if x is zero, e to the minus lambda x is one. It behaves something like this. Okay, and then I'm also going to plot the function one minus x, which is the straight line joining these two points. So this is one minus x. So x is on the x-axis. This is the function one minus x. And this curve is the function e to the minus lambda x. Okay, and so this curve and this line have to meet somewhere. And where they meet is rho lambda. So for a given value of lambda, by, by finding this solution, by finding where this curve and this line intersect, you get the fraction of uh, vertices that belong to the giant component. And the remaining one minus lambda times n vertices all lie in strong components. So uh, I drew this, but there was something implicitly I assumed in drawing this, namely that the curve goes below the line at the origin. And for that to be true, the slope, but the slope of the curve, the slope of the line is one, the slope of the curve or minus one. The slope of the curve has to be more negative than minus one, and that happens if lambda is bigger than one. If lambda is smaller than one, the curve lies above the line and the only intersection is at zero. Okay, and so that's saying, if you like that the fraction of vertices in the giant component is zero. Uh, okay, so that's the picture. And again, what happens intuitively as you increase P, when P is zero, there are uh, each node is in a connected component by itself. As you increase P, some edges start to appear at different places in the graph. As you increase P some more, some of these edges start to, uh, these components grow bigger. There are more edges connecting them uh, and so on. And somehow suddenly as at P equals one over N, a lot of these components which had, which were small, uh, a lot of them join up all at once to make a giant component. And as you increase P further, this giant component keeps growing bigger and bigger and starts uh, swallowing up more and more of connecting up with more of the small components which then disappear into the giant, or rather get absorbed into the giant component. Okay, and so the giant component grows and the remaining components, which are of size log n, uh, shrink. That's the picture you have. Uh, okay, we are not going to prove this theorem, but we are going to give some intuition for why this uh, seemingly strange behavior happens. Why is there this sharp transition at lambda equals one? Okay, so let's consider the Edrish-Renyi random graph GNP.
So we are going to fix one vertex and look at the connected component containing this vertex. So at the start, pick one vertex and look at, uh, look at the graph uh, starting from this vertex. So what's the connected component to which this vertex belongs? Uh, for a given value of p. If p is zero, it, it's not connected to anything. Uh, it's in a connected component by itself. If p is something bigger, then let's find out its connected component. So let's start exploring from here. Uh, so first we can ask how many neighbors does this have? So you've picked a vertex, let's call it U. How many neighbors does U have? It has some random number of neighbors. Let's denote uh, by N of U, the neighbors of U, all the vertices. V such that UV is an edge. in the edge set of G and P more precisely. Uh, okay, then what's the size of the set N U? Now each vertex V is a neighbor of U with probability P, and this is independently true for every possible vertex. So the size of the set is clearly this is a random variable and its distribution is binomial equivalent distribution to a binomial with parameters n minus one. There are n minus one other possible vertices and each edge is present with probability p. Okay, so as you explore the connected components starting from u, you first see a random number of neighbors which have a given binomial distribution. Then you can go to one of these neighbors, V, and look at its neighborhood. Uh, okay, and it's, there, it's going to have some other random number of neighbors. Maybe it has three neighbors. Uh, but what, how many neighbors does it have? It's also binomial with the same parameters. But let's exclude you. We've already seen you. We should also exclude everything else in the neighborhood we've seen. So it's actually binomial n minus one minus the size of the neighborhood of u times p. Okay, and similarly for, we go to some other w, we explore its neighborhood. Some of its neighbors may be vertices you've already seen. So maybe one of the neighbors of w is this vertex. Uh, one of them is this vertex, which is a neighbor of V and then there are some more vertices, maybe only one more new neighbor, etc. And so you can recursively explore the neighborhood of U uh, and see how many new vertices you get when you go to each of its neighbors. Okay, but the point I want to make is that if P is small, if P is uh, okay, there are a couple of points I want to make. So uh, if P is lambda over N, then what does this distribution binomial N minus one P look like? <clears throat> Uh, so what's, what does a binomial with a large N and a small P look like? It's close to a Poisson distribution with parameter N times P. So this binomial is approximately a Poisson with parameter N minus one times P. 
but if n is big, n minus one times p and n times p are almost the same, and that's lambda. So this is approximately Poisson lambda. Okay, and as you continue exploring the neighborhood, when you start exploring the neighborhood from V, uh, the chances of seeing a vertex that one of the neighbors you pick is something that was already a neighbor is very small. Uh, and so uh, this binomial, the parameters here are again close to N and again, the binomial n minus one minus what you have to subtract here is tiny compared to the total number of vertices. And so this is again approximately Poisson lambda. So starting from each vertex, you see a Poisson number of Poisson lambda number of neighbors. Uh, and this keeps happening until this. So two things could happen as you keep exploring the neighborhood starting from this vertex. <clears throat> Remember, you could have zero neighbors. This Poisson random variable can take the value zero. So sometimes you, you maybe this, when you explore from here, you see no new neighbors at all. Uh, so the neighborhood may not grow or it may grow by a random amount depending on this Poisson. And so as you explore this connected component, it keeps growing or it may at some point stop growing. And then you have finished exploring the connected component and you have identified all the vertices to which you is connected. Uh, and at least initially, the way the connected component grows, it grows by the same number of vertices each time, independent of what you've seen so far. And there's a, uh, a name for processes that grow like this. They are called branching processes. And uh, so the neighborhood exploration process behaves like a branching process initially. And to know whether this uh, quickly stops growing and you only get a small connected component or it keeps growing for a large time and you get a big connected, large number of steps and you get a big connected component, that depends on the behavior of the branching process. Does it, uh, okay, so uh, I won't say more at this point. I'll just say uh, that motivates our study of branching processes and so, what we are going to do now is introduce branching processes and state what questions we want to ask about branching processes. Okay, so that's our next topic. branching processes. So let me define the process. It starts with, let's say, one individual, uh, or, or it could start with some fixed finite number of individuals, but for convenience, I'll take it to be one. Um, so here's time, and time is going to be discrete and proceed in generations. So here's time. So in generation one, we start with a single individual. Uh, if you like, think of it as a bacterium. Uh, and it has a random number of offspring. So it's, uh, it, so it lives for a fixed amount of time and dies. And before it dies, it gives birth to a random number of offspring. So maybe three here. Okay, so it has three children and it dies. And then, so in generation two, we have uh, three individuals in the population. And now each of these children behave in the same way. 
And this number three might be fixed, it might be random. So may, let's say it's random. So this has a random number of children, which happen to be three. And similarly, each of these children have a random number of children with the same distribution and independent of each other. So those are the crucial assumptions here. The distribution of the number of children is the same and they are independent of each other. So this again has a random number of children. Maybe this has two children. This has zero children and this has one child before they die. So again, in generation three, we ended up with three individuals because of, um, because of the random numbers of children that each of the individuals in the previous generation had. Okay, and this is a branching process. Uh, and so how do we describe it? Let me introduce some notation. So Zn is going to be the number of individuals in generation n. Okay, so in the picture we've drawn, Z1 is one, Z2 is three, and Z3 was also three. So these are the random variables we are interested in, but we are going to construct them in terms of other random variables which describe uh, the number of children that each individual has. So Xi, we are going to define a family of random variables, Xi ij. And this is going to denote uh, the number of children of the jth individual in the ith generation of the jth individual in the ith generation. Okay, and in this picture, therefore, Xi11 was three, the first individual in the first generation had three children. Uh, Xi21, the first individual in the second generation had two children. Xi22 was zero. And Xi23 was one. Okay, so I hope this picture is completely clear. Good, so this is how we construct a branching process. So we are going to define a family of random variables Xi ij uh, for all i in the natural numbers, so i equals 1, 2, 3, etc. And j equals 1, 2, 3. So we have this doubly infinite collection of random variables. <clears throat> and these are going to be IID, independent and identically distributed random variables. Integer, okay. Uh, random variables. Taking values in. <clears throat> in the non-negative integers. So you, they could be zero children, so <clears throat> not one, two, three, and so on, okay? <clears throat> so it, it might be that we don't need all these random variables to construct this process. For instance, we didn't care what psi uh, one, two was, because in the first 
generation, we started with a single individual. So uh, we didn't care how many children the second individual in the first generation would have had uh, if such an individual existed. But, but we might as well start with all these random variables. So if we have all this family of random variables given to us, then we can construct uh, the branching process and it's defined as follows. So let's say Z1 is given, you could take it to be random if you like, or uh, we are going to take Z1 equals one, but you could take it to be some other given number or even a random number. And from Zn, given Zn, we are going to define Zn plus one as the sum j equals one to Zn, psi nj. So if we know the number of individuals Zn present in the nth generation, then the number of individuals in the n plus one generation is the sum of the number of children or offspring of, uh, of each of the individuals present in, in generation n. So recursively we define uh, the branching process for all time. Okay, so this, this is the definition of a branching process. I hope that's clear. Okay, and what are the questions we are going to be interested in? There's one main question we are going to be interested in, and that is, does the branching process, which I'll abbreviate BP from now on, uh, become extinct? So is there some random number of generations after which the population becomes zero, Zn becomes zero. Does the branching process become extinct or does it survive forever? Okay, so that's that's the question we want to answer. Okay, and I'm going to start with an elementary lemma. It might be a different number in the notes. Uh, so let's suppose that the mean number of offspring, so which let's denote that by mu, suppose mu, which is defined as the expectation of the number of offspring. So it, we can pick any one of these random variables. Let me pick psi 1, 1. We could have equally picked psi i, j. They have the same distribution and hence the same mean. So suppose that this mean is strictly smaller than 1. Uh, then the branching process Zn equals uh, one, two, three, etc. Then this branching process becomes extinct with probability one. And what exactly do we mean by this? So the probability that Zn uh, is strictly positive, so pick a row equal to one, there's at least one individual in every generation for all n, uh, this probability is zero. The probability of the event that Zn is at least one for all generations n is zero. 
that's the statement of the lemma. And let's prove that next. Proof is quite easy and it follows from Markov's inequality. We are going to calculate the expected number of, uh, the expected size of the nth generation, the expected number of individuals in the nth generation. And we'll do that recursively. So let's do it for the n plus one generation in fact. So what is the expectation of Z n plus one? This is hard to calculate from scratch, but if I gave you Z n, then it would be easy for you to calculate that. If I told you there were uh, seven individuals in generation N, and on average, they have 1.2 children each, then you know this, you, it's just seven times 1.2, it's 8.4. So what exactly are we doing there? We are using, so we are going to calculate this expectation using the tower rule. So we know how to calculate the conditional expectation of Zn plus one, given Zn. And since we know how to do this, if we again take the expectation with respect to Zn, so this conditional expectation is a function of Zn, it's a random variable. And if we take the expectation of that function of Zn, we get a number, and that number is the main number of offspring in the n plus one generation. And this equality I've written here, you've seen this before, this is called the tower rule or the law of conditional, uh, the law of iterated expectation. Okay, so let's calculate the conditional expectations. So the expectation of Zn plus one given Zn. Okay, so suppose I give you that it's some value K is the expectation of the sum J equals one to K Xi N J. Right, all I've done here is write the definition of Zn plus one. Zn plus one is the sum of Xi and J, J going from one to Zn. And Zn is now given, it's some number K. So this is what we have. And then uh, this is just the sum J equals one to K, expectation of Xi and J. And why is this true? Why can I switch the order of expectation and summation? This is by linearity of expectation. Okay, and Xi and J was, uh, the expectation of this was defined as mu, so this is mu times K. Uh, or the expectation of Zn plus one given Zn is mu times Zn. And therefore the expectation of Zn plus one, going back to the first line, is the expectation of the conditional expectation. We worked out the conditional expectation, it was mu times Zn, and so the expectation mu is a fixed constant, the it's not random, the expectation of a constant times Zn is mu times the constant times the expectation of Zn. Okay, so that's it. So we've calculated the expectation of Zn plus one, uh, and let's uh, repeat this process. So continuing with the proof. Uh, 
we saw that the expectation of Zn plus one was mu times the expectation of Zn. We also have Z1 equals one. And so these two things together imply that the, and so the expectation of Z1 is one. The expectation of a constant is that constant. And these two things together imply that if the expectation of Zn is mu to the n minus one. Okay, now uh, we assume that the mean number of offspring was strictly smaller than one in the statement of the lemma. Uh, if mu is less than one, then mu to the n or mu to the n minus one tends to zero as n tends to infinity. Okay, and what can we say about the probability of the event that Zn is bigger than one, uh, sorry, bigger or equal to one, that the process has not gone extinct by time n, and so there's at least one individual alive in this generation. This probability is bounded above by the mean of Zn divided by one by and so this is mu to the n minus one. And this bound holds by Markov's inequality. Okay, so we have shown that the probability that the branching process is still alive in generation n uh, behaves like mu to the n minus one. And so it decreases to zero as n tends to infinity. The probability that it's still alive in generation n is decreasing to zero. Uh, the event we are interested in, uh, the event that said n bigger or equal to one for all n, that this is the intersection n equals one to infinity of the events that said n is bigger or equal to one. So I've just rewritten the same event a bit more formally. Or, okay, uh, that a statement is true for all n is the intersection of the nth statement for all the n. Um, and uh, now, uh, if you look at the intersection, say, m equals 1 to n of zm bigger or equal to 1, the intersection of these events Let's give this event a name. Let's call this event AN. AN is this intersection. Then uh, AN is a decreasing sequence of events, meaning that AN plus one is contained in AN. So it's a decreasing sequence of events. An event is a set, remember that. So and these, this is a decreasing sequence of sets, meaning that the next set in the sequence is a subset of the previous set. Because one more thing gets taken into the intersection. And so, uh, let me clear some space. Continue the proof of the lemma. So a n is the intersection m equals one to n uh, z m bigger or equal to one. So a n is the event that the process is still alive 
in generation n. Uh, and this is a decreasing sequence of events. And what we are interested in uh, is the probability um, of A infinity, the intersection of all these events. Uh, and it's a, a property of probability distribution. So the probability of A infinity, A infinity is the intersection of all these things. Uh, it's uh, and its probability is the limit as n goes to infinity of p a n the probability of a n and this is a this this is a statement about probabilities this is called the continuity of probability if you did a quite a formal course in probability uh, with axioms and theorems, you would have seen a proof of this result. Uh, okay, and we saw that P A N tends to zero as N tends to infinity because um, it's bounded about by mu to the N minus one and therefore P A infinity is zero. Okay, and this was the event we were interested in, that the branching process never becomes extinct. I, the probability that the branching process survives forever is zero. And the probability that it becomes extinct is one. So that was the statement of the lemma and that completes the proof. Okay, so we know what happens if the mean offspring size is smaller than one. So next time we look at what happens if the mean offspring size is bigger than one. It turns out that then the branching process has positive probability of surviving forever. It's not guaranteed that probability is not one. It could still go extinct just by chance, but with some non-zero probability, it survives forever. Okay, so that's the end of uh, this lecture.